The year was 2013. Jack, who, as you might recall, is a fictional patient of mine, had been doing really well. He called me to make an appointment one afternoon. He had been anxious about his daughter and he had a dream that he wanted to discuss with me. Welcome back to Brain Politics. I am Dr. Rajiv Parinja and today we are going to meet a character in our kingdom who is truly very ancient. If there is anything that you want, this neural system is driving it. This is the treasurer of the realm. This is the brain's reward system. This system continues to be the subject of tremendous interest on the part of neuroscientists. It is not fully understood, but we do know a lot about it. Today, I am going to take dreams and stories from Jack's life to demonstrate the rules by which it operates. There is one vital life lesson that we can draw from the rules that govern this system. Not knowing that life lesson can be detrimental to your mental health and well-being. Let's start with a warm-up, with a bit of evolutionary thinking, like we did in our last episode. Please pay attention to the sensations you are getting from your feet and see if you can figure out, without looking, what you are wearing. Are you wearing socks? Are you wearing shoes or sandals? You can feel what you're wearing because that sensory information is being sent to your brain all the time by nerve endings in your feet. Normally, you aren't paying any attention to it. Our brain has a gatekeeper called the thalamus, which only allows relevant information to draw your attention. The ordinary sensations that come from our feet don't qualify. Now imagine that you feel something touching your leg, and that sensation is moving up your leg as if something is crawling. Oh boy, that would capture your attention completely and make you want to jump and flick this thing off your body. It doesn't matter if you had been worried and deep in thought about anything before you felt this thing crawling. You will probably drop it and pay attention to the creepy crawly. Individually, the sensation of something touching your feet may not draw your attention, but something new touching your feet and then moving upwards is a pattern that your brain recognizes as an emergency situation which absolutely needs immediate attention. This, of course, makes sense because being bitten by a creepy crawly can be painful and dangerous. Let's take another example. Imagine that you had stubbed your toe shortly before you started listening to the podcast. Your toe is sending the sensation of pain, which is quite different from the sensation of touch. Pain pulls your attention and is unpleasant. The brain reacts to pain differently because there is a benefit to paying attention to pain. You protect the part that is in pain from further injury by guarding it from pressure, allowing it to heal. You also learn not to do whatever it is that you did to cause the injury in the first place. Let's go with Jack into one of his dreams. Jack is dreaming that he is taking a walk through the woods when he sees a monkey. The monkey is hungry and is looking for food. Jack is feeling a little worried for the monkey. But then the monkey finds a banana tree and eats a banana. Jack feels reassured. We will meet the monkey again in future episodes. To understand the role of the reward system, it's worth thinking about the earliest life forms as they evolved from being unable to move to being mobile. If we take certain bacteria, which can move, and put them in a sugar solution with less sugar on one side and more on the other, 
they will move towards the higher sugar concentration. This ability to move towards something that might be helpful for our survival is preserved across the animal kingdom. The reward system directs this by making us pay attention to things that have a relevance to our survival. It makes us want and like certain things. As we move to get the things we like and want, the reward system also helps us learn to do what works to get the things that we like and want. Of course, our brains are complex and the reward system can't just want one thing and stop at that. It must take into account what else is available that it could want instead. Should it want less of the things that are difficult to get and more of the things that are easier to get? If it keeps getting what it wants, should the reward system still want it as much or should it want it a little less? The brain's treasurer tries to deal with all of these issues and in this episode, we will take some stories from Jack's life to learn the rules that govern the answers to these questions. The brain's treasurer sits in the lower part of the brain and connects something called the ventral tegmental area to nucleus accumbens in something called the ventral striatum. There is also a connection with a higher part of the brain called the orbitofrontal cortex. The treasurer of the brain assigns a value to anything that we want and even when we want different things which are difficult to compare, such as should I go for a run or book the hotels for my next vacation? The connection with the orbital frontal cortex allows the treasurer to compare them as if they were in the same currency. Every drug of abuse stimulates the reward system as a final common pathway, regardless of whether it's an upper or a downer. The treasurer has some very important peculiarities that are worth knowing because as with the ice cream example in our last episode, where we saw how our brain's tendency to prefer lots of sugar and cream is not a great fit for the modern environment. The treasurer's design would have worked really well in the environment of our ancestors when they were hunter-gatherers. There weren't really any large rewards available to them. Our modern environment does allow the possibility of some very large rewards and many of them are relatively easy to obtain. This is a problem, as we will find out in a moment. Jack has been an addict. He is in recovery at the moment and he has been sober for many years. He has followed the 12-step programs very thoroughly with excellent results. In the early part of his recovery, he had many relapses. He understands that you can't just start and stop using recreational drugs as you wish. Addiction is a disease which changes the brain, which makes it incredibly difficult to just stop the drug use when you feel like it. But he wants to know why. Let's take another one of Jack's dreams to look at a peculiarity of how young people think about addiction. Jack's daughter Becky had started high school. Some of her friends were using marijuana. One of her friends was sharing her prescription Adderall with another friend. Becky thought this was all quite normal. She told her dad that she didn't think her friends would come to harm from a little bit of marijuana. She had herself never used it, but she had thought about it. She would not commit to not using it. She told her father that she did not think that she would be an addict just by using a bit of recreational stuff. Jack found that frustrating. His recovery from addiction had taken a lot of effort and a lot of time. 
He didn't want his daughter to go through the same process and pay the same cost as he had had to pay. He wanted her to learn from his mistakes. He had been thinking a lot about this when he went to bed one night. He had a strange dream that night. In his dream, he saw that his daughter had started using drugs. She was buying stimulants from some kind of a phone order drug dealer. In his dream, he was watching her place a call to a drug dealer. But instead of reaching a real person, she had come to a recorded voice, just like when you call the customer service for a bank or a big store. The voice at the other end of the phone said, Welcome back to the illegal and recreational drug store. Our highs can get you out of your lows. If you would like to be an addict before your next order, please press 1. If you would like to continue to order without becoming an addict, please press 2. Jack felt furious. He wanted to get Becky's attention. He was calling out to her, but she wasn't listening. So he started shouting, and then he woke up. It took him a moment to realize that he had been dreaming. He told me, I never thought I was going to be an addict. Nor did any of the people I have worked with in the 12-step programs. That's what kids think. They can have a bit of harmless fun. They become addicts and everyone around them knows before they do. I agreed with him. I told him, if there is a choice in addiction that comes before the first time that you use an addictive substance. You could choose not to use the very first time. Once you start using, the question doesn't pop up on a screen where you tick the box that you're going to be an addict. Nobody chooses to be an addict. They find themselves afflicted with addiction. Some people may use a bit of marijuana and other recreational drugs without coming to much harm, but many of them will become addicted. If people use hard drugs, they are much more likely to become addicted. You can treat addiction and overcome it, but it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time. Jack told me he wanted to understand the reward system in a way that would be easy to explain to a teenager, in a way that did not require any specialized training in neuroscience or psychology. I told him that the reward system is involved in wanting, liking, and learning to get the things that we like. The reward system is so closely linked with the pleasure systems that for a long time it was thought that the main neurotransmitter of the reward system, dopamine, was actually the neurotransmitter of pleasure. We now know that this is not the case and the pleasure system has hot spots that are spread throughout the brain. That itself is interesting because pleasure is designed in such a way that a head injury or a small stroke is not going to eliminate pleasure. Pleasure seems to be quite vital to human survival. But pleasure and reward are closely linked. We want the things that we find pleasurable. The reward system is predominantly a wanting system. It is also an anticipatory system. The reward system is designed to answer the question, what is the best thing for me to do with the time and energy that I have at this moment? When we have a range of options, the reward system attaches a want and like value to each of them. If you're really hungry and you have a choice of meals, you will find yourself wanting the larger or higher calorie meal. As a simplification, anything that we want to do is because it makes us feel pleasure or it makes us avoid something that is physically or emotionally painful. The more dopamine that is released, the more we want something. And this can be a problem with drugs because they can chemically induce the release of large amounts of dopamine, making us want them more than anything else that releases less dopamine. As the brain's treasurer, the reward system keeps track of future possibilities and determines how much you like each possibility. You might be looking forward to getting a raise, 
a promotion, buying a house, getting married, getting divorced, having children, or finishing off a project. The reward system works for the small things as well. You might look forward to finishing your morning walk. You might look forward to getting some lunch. At times, our minds wander to the future and we anticipate getting rewards. When thinking about the future reward, we also think about the strategy to get that reward. The reward system also closely tracks the discrepancy between the expected reward and the actual reward. If you were not expecting a pay raise but got one, you would find that more rewarding than getting it when you had already expected it. Similarly, if you had anticipated getting a large pay rise but got a small one, it will draw your attention and make you upset. The reward system has some peculiarities which can be summarized in about 10 rules which we will learn from stories from Jack's life. You don't have to remember all the rules but still have a sense of how exactly it works. When Jack was a young college student working in a burger joint, he was making about $4 an hour in the early 90s. He worked hard and was unhappy with the pay. A friend of his worked at a restaurant and made about $50 in tip every night for about five hours of work. Jack wanted a job like that. One day, he gets a call from his friend. His friend says that the restaurant has an opening and offers to introduce him to the manager. Jack is already beginning to feel good and he is wanting this job because he anticipates that he could make $50 in tip every evening just like his friend. This thought is already making him feel rewarded and that gives us rule one. Anticipation of something we want is rewarding. When Jack gets the job, and takes home his first $50, he feels good. One day, he gets about $70 in tips, which gets his attention. This is more than his usual expectation. This gives us rule two. Unexpected positive outcomes make us feel rewarded. However, over the next several days, he makes an average of $50 every day. And as you might expect, he doesn't get the same pleasure from that amount of money anymore. This gives us rule three. The reward system gets used to any reward that it gets repeatedly and doesn't respond in the same way. It needs a bigger reward to get the same response. Jack is really good with accounts and computing, which he's studying at college. The restaurant owner finds out about this and offers him a job which pays him $15 an hour involving accounts and managing the computer systems for the restaurant. You can imagine that he would prefer this job where he's making a lot more money. This gives us rule four. We prefer to go after larger rewards over smaller rewards. This might seem like stating the obvious, but I want to emphasize that this doesn't have to be a rational, well-considered decision. This is something we feel like doing. You can do it without thinking. If an expected reward is lost, it can be annoying. One day, Jack made $30 in tips and actually felt rather annoyed at his stingy customers. His expectation was set at 50 and what he got was less. This gives us rule five. Loss of an anticipated reward produces an emotional reaction. Now let's take this story further and add a little twist to it. A few months after starting this job, Jack gets a call from a lawyer. He finds that an aunt who had died some months ago had her will read and she had left him a hundred thousand dollars in her will. He gets a huge feeling of reward on the anticipated inheritance of a hundred thousand dollars. He also thinks about what he could do with all that money. He could get a new car. He could go on a nice vacation. He could also move into a nicer apartment. Each of these prospects produces a sense of reward. That evening, he barely notices 
the $50 of tips he received. His reward system seems unresponsive to that relatively small sum of money when it is already firing up for $100,000. This gives us rule six. When our reward system is responding to very large rewards, it responds less well to small rewards. Jack is waiting for his inheritance and three months pass. He's feeling a little anxious, so he decides to call the lawyer. The lawyer tells him that his aunt had a lot of debts and liens which she hadn't factored into her will and her assets were less valuable than she thought they were. The lawyer is not sure how much Jack would get, but offers his best guess. I don't think anything would be left. Now Jack is furious. The reward that he had anticipated has been lost. He had planned to get a car and pay off some of his high interest loans. As his anger builds up, he's thinking about his aunt. He's also feeling angry towards the lawyer. He begins to recall every incident where he has heard of a lawyer being unprofessional. But if he had any good experiences with lawyers, those are not readily available to him at this time. A few months later, you can imagine that Jack has mostly recovered from the setback of the lost inheritance. He is once again working at the restaurant, making about $50 in tips. And now his brain is once again responding to that reward as it did before he had heard of the inheritance. This gives us rule seven. After some time of not getting a large reward, the system resets and is again able to respond to small reward. Now, in this rule, I have said that the system resets, but there can be exceptions where this reset is only partial. Let's follow Jack through his career. Jack makes it big, and 10 years after his job at the restaurant, he is making $200,000 working for an investment bank. Jack has gone through the process of anticipating many promotions, pay increases, and gradually got used to them, and right now, he's getting a regular large paycheck. Jack's company takes a big hit in the financial crisis and lays off many people. He finds himself unemployed and unable to find a job because no financial companies are hiring at that time. After a few months of unemployment, he's able to get a job as a manager for a restaurant chain for a salary of $50,000 a year. You can imagine that his reward system, which is used to getting $200,000 a year, is not really getting a huge reward from the $50,000. In fact, he has a colleague who is doing the same job and drawing the same salary. This colleague is earning the highest salary that he has ever earned. And if we compare Jack's reward system with his colleagues, we will find that Jack's reward system has a deficit. It's not quite responding the same as his colleagues, even though they're earning the same amount of money. And this is because he is used to something higher, which his brain still remembers. And this gives us rule eight. If we get used to really large rewards, we remember them and our reward system makes us crave the large rewards and finds smaller rewards less satisfying. This can be permanent. Jack's physician was trying to help him lose weight. They discussed that Jack seemed to eat a lot of cookies. Jack considered his habit of eating cookies and found that even when he had eaten a meal and felt so full that he left some of the food uneaten, he would still go and grab a couple of cookies. He said, I don't really have any desire to eat them. I just do it without thinking. There is a lot of research that suggests Wanting and liking don't always work in parallel. Our brain can learn to want things that we don't necessarily like as much anymore. The wanting part seems to persist despite reduced liking after repeated use. We will discuss this idea further when we talk about habits, but here we have rule nine. Even when we don't like something as much after repeated use, we can continue to want it and seek it. Jack had two friends who lived in his neighborhood who moved away in the same month. One of them 
moved five miles out and the other one moved 50 miles out. Jack likes seeing each of them about the same, but he found himself seeing the friend who moved five miles away a lot more because it took a lot less effort. This gives us rule 10. We factor in the effort it takes to get a rewarding outcome when deciding whether we want to pursue it. That's all of the 10 rules. And alcohol and other addictive substances chemically stimulate the reward system. And all of these rules apply to them. At this point in our conversation, Jack was getting a little impatient. That's a lot of rules, Doc, he said. What is the one important life lesson that you were talking about earlier? To understand this, I said, we need to look a little bit at the brain's pleasure system and how it's calibrated. We can think of people as having a pleasure baseline. For Jack, on an average day, when he was not expecting anything particularly exciting or particularly bad to happen, he would wake up and feel about a 6 out of 10. So we walked through a common day and saw how his pleasure level changed through the day. On his way to work, he encounters a traffic jam, which takes him down to a 4 out of 10. But the jam doesn't take too long, and he's able to get to work without being particularly late. And he returns to a 6 out of 10. He bumps into one of his colleagues who he really likes. That takes him to a 7 out of 10. He sits down on, the, on his computer and opens his emails and sees something about a project deadline that he finds irritating. It takes him to a 5 out of 10. He goes for lunch and finds that the cafeteria is serving his favorite spaghetti. This takes him to a 7 out of 10. These are normal day-to-day -day fluctuations and he always seems to return to his baseline of about 6 out of 10. But something interesting happens when he goes on a vacation. He is feeling an 8 out of 10 on the vacation and then a 9 out of 10. But when he comes back, he wakes up next morning feeling a 4 out of 10 at the prospect of having to go to work again. It takes him a day or two to return to his baseline of 6 out of 10. This is the kind of compensation that the brain does to big deviations from the baseline. The brain seems to push in the opposite direction of where our pleasure level is moving if the move is too big. This is called the opponent process theory. Jack was intrigued by this. He wanted to know if it works the other way as well. If he's too low, would the brain compensate and take him higher? We discussed that this was possible as long as his mental health was not affected by whatever was making him low. There was a time when Jack had gone to his PCP for an annual checkup. He had been coughing for a few weeks and his doctor got him a chest x-ray which showed a kind of shadow. His doctor was worried about it and could not rule out a cancer. His doctor wanted him to get a CT scan of his chest. Jack tried to get an appointment for a CT scan but there was none available for two weeks. Jack was freaking out. He did not want to be sitting with an untreated cancer. He called his doctor's office, but there was no way of getting a CT scan the same day in the outpatient setting. They told him he did not need to be admitted to the hospital. They asked him to keep calling radiology for any cancellations. For the next two days, Jack was feeling a 2 or 3 out of 10 with his stress and anxiety. On the third morning, there was a cancellation and he was able to get a CT scan which showed no abnormalities. The shadow on the x-ray had been an artifact. That day, Jack was feeling an 8 out of 10 for the rest of the day. It is hard to recommend going down on your pleasure levels because this can trigger problems. Jack could have been left with anxiety or depression because of his stressful experience after the chest x-ray findings. 
There are people who recommend doing difficult things, such as going on hikes or taking cold showers, which can be tiring or unpleasant, but lead to a rebound improvement in your sense of well-being. This may be a good idea as long as you don't do it in a way that puts your health at risk. If you push the dopamine and pleasure neurotransmitter levels out of the physiological range, this can lead to a change of the scale, which I like to think of as a recalibration. As an example, if Jack were to take a drug that feels like he's at a 20 out of 10, the brain responds by recalibrating the scale. Now the 20 feels like a 10, but the 6, which is his baseline, feels like a 3. If Jack would do that, he would wake up feeling a 3 out of 10 every morning and conclude that he just feels depressed all the time, except when he's using drugs. I hear this a lot from my patients. Now, many of them have trauma which has caused their baseline to be very low even before they started using drugs, but some of them had a normal baseline which dropped after they started using drugs. Stimulating the reward system by using substances that cause large quantities of dopamine release is a bad idea for two important reasons. One, it resets your priority system to prefer these rewards over ordinary day-to-day -day rewards which are readily available. Two, it resets your pleasure scale to a lower baseline. And this leads me to the vital life lesson. If you constantly chase pleasure, your brain will respond by making pleasure less pleasurable. If you use chemicals, including those derived from nature, such as cannabinoids and opioids, to stimulate your brain's pleasure and reward systems, your brain can change in a way that you are no longer able to enjoy the normal things in life and you feel unmotivated to do them. Some of these changes may be permanent. Addiction is treatable, but it takes time and effort. If you are a young person who has never used drugs but is thinking about it, I know of no worse choice that you can make for your mental health and well-being. As we discussed in our first episode, this might make some people have some reactance, which is a normal response to something coming from someone with a position of authority. If you are feeling a little upset listening to this, it may be because I'm saying things that take away your anticipated reward. This is how the brain works. It produces emotions that make you want to act in ways that allow you to keep your reward. In our next episode, we meet the Duke of the Realm. This is the brain's emotional system. This system makes us think, feel, and remember things in a way that is in keeping with the emotional state we are in. It makes us want and not want certain things. When the Duke is coming on strong, he runs the realm. He does not like compromises and half measures. He wants to subject his opponents to complete and humiliating defeat. If you have questions or comments, please go to wgte.org slash brain politics. I am Dr. Rajiv Parinja. I am your host and producer. Our executive producer is Chris Pfeiffer. This is Brain Politics. I hope you will join me for the next episode. WGTE. Voices around us. WGTE is supported in part by American Rescue Plan Act funds allocated by the City of Toledo and the Lucas County Commissioners and administered by the Arts Commission.